He is a certified Les Brown speaker, coach and trainer. He is a highly sought after speaker and trainer conducting presentations on life skills, motivation and living your best life. After a near-death encounter, he went from depending on a 24-hour nursing care to learning how to live, learning how to walk again and gaining his independence. Today, he is grateful to have the ability to dress himself, drive and use his voice to inspire others. He is a proud parent with goals of changing the world with his story and personal insights. Ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Nowlin. Farouk, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to have me here, taking the time out to give me on your show, do this interview, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to have you here in this particular show. Jonathan, I know you as a motivational speaker, as a coach, as a trainer, as a facilitator. You travel around the United States and conduct programs. You are connected with one of the top leadership and motivational coaches and leaders in the world. But I would like to know your story before you became a motivational speaker. Would you like to take us to the background, where you started with? Absolutely. And, you know, I like to start with me growing up as a child it was difficult. I had some, there were certain different circumstances. We didn't have much money. I even got involved in the wrong crowd. Mm -hmm. I ended up getting in trouble with the laws and even ventured off into drugs. I was, I was addicted to drugs that time. Okay. And you know, there was, there was a major breaking point in my life when mm -hmm. I ended up in a wheelchair. I yeah. ended up getting into to a severe car accident, which I would love to share with you. I really, this is a story that I actually get to share with thousands of people on stage. And it starts back in 2014, where mm -hmm. I was driving. I was on an interstate, a 95. It's the interstate in Florida. And I was coming off of an exit where I didn't complete the turn. And at that moment, I was ejected out of the sunroof of the car. And I ripped my ear off. I broke my neck, my back, my clavicle, my ribs. And I landed in a pond and I drowned. I was in a coma for two months. They froze my body for 17 days to test a robot on me. But this is the best part, Farouk. When I was in my coma, I remember my dreams. And in my dreams, I was a multimillionaire. I was flying from China to here in Florida. I had this beautiful wife. She was Korean. You can have any wife you want when you're in a coma. <laughs> And in real life, Farouk, when I was a little boy growing up, my grandpa, I called him Papa. He'd take me fishing every weekend. He taught me how to tie fishing hooks. He taught me how to run a fishing boat. Well, he passed away 15 years ago, and we dumped his ashes in the ocean because he was a fisherman. Mm -hmm. And my Papa was in my coma. He was the biggest fish in the whole world. Everybody wanted to catch him, and I could swim with him. And I was up in the clouds. I was with my grandpa, and I was with God. And we were looking down at me on the operating table, and I had tubes in my mouth, in my throat, in my chest. And at that moment, they were telling my family, go home. Jonathan will be dead by Monday. And when I realized I was looking down at me dead, I got so scared inside, and I hit my knees, and I grabbed God, and I said, just give me one more chance. I won't do what I've done. I won't be who I was. Just one more chance at life. And at that very second, I woke from my coma. Wow. Yeah. And I'll tell you, when I woke from my coma, I was paralyzed from the nipple line down. I couldn't feel or move anything. I needed help with things you don't want help with, and they were doing things to me you don't want done to you. Mm -hmm. And as I laid there in that hospital and, and, and all of this stuff set into me, I, I wasn't even able to talk. I wasn't even able to talk. I had a tracheotomy. And it was a devastating time in my life. But I'll tell you, it was also a, a major opportunity in my life. There's something I live by today, and it's that everything in life is either an opportunity to grow mm -hmm. or it's an obstacle that will keep us from growing. Yeah. And so that's, 
that's what took place. And I'll tell you, living with circumstances, today I'm in a wheelchair. I, I've been in a wheelchair for four years. And as I go through this world, I get a lot of the time, people ask me, they say, how do you keep going? How do you keep pushing? I see you're in the gym. You work out harder than most of these people in here that walk. How are you doing it? What drives you? And, you know, the biggest key to success, the biggest key, I believe, to having a happy life, the biggest key to fulfilling on your dreams. And keep pushing at it when it's hard and when people are there, not there to support you. The biggest key, and I get this from Zig Ziglar, he's one of my favorite authors, is that we have to control our input, what goes in our mind. You know, how do I keep going is because I create routines and habits and rituals. Mm -hmm to put good content into my mind on a daily basis throughout the day. You know, there's the old Earl Nightingale, one of my favorites. He says, he says, we become what we think about. Yeah. Uh, so Earl Nightingale, he's also one of my favorites. And as you think, he says, we become what we think about. Yeah. And so how do we control what we think about? Mm -hmm. Majority of people in, in, in life, if you think about this, is that we're beings that are built to control our mind and control yeah. our body. That's true. Majority of people allow their minds and their bodies to control them. Mm -hmm. That's why there's eating disorders. That's why we we have people with anxiety, depression, and all these fears that control them from moving forward. So how do we start to control our mind? And it's by controlling what goes into our mind. I love this. And I, I created this story. I want everybody to think who's ever watching as well as you think of this. When you were five years old, mm -hmm. you were whole, complete, and perfect in every way. Yep. There's nothing you could add to you as a five-year-old that's going to make you more whole, complete, and perfect. Do mm -hmm. you agree? Yep, absolutely. And so you think of this, and you're five years old. The world is exciting. This place is awesome. We want it. We have so many questions. We are like, what is this? How does this work? Why are these people different colors? What's in this? I want to do that. And we have all of these ideas. One of the worst things you'll tell a five-year-old is to take a nap. He don't want to miss nothing. <laughs> we don't want to miss this world. And so as we go through life, this is what takes place between five and 10 years old and sometimes 15 most important years of the life. Mm -hmm. Because that input that we get, we set foundations and standards for who we are as a being for the rest of our life. Absolutely. And so as we're going and we have all these questions, we say, what's this? How does this work? This is what happens. We get situations. We get circumstances and input. And yeah. majority of the time, we start to get, no, stop. Leave it alone. Don't do that. You're not going to understand this, so don't worry about it. You know, you're really good at doing this, not so good at doing that, so you should probably stick with this. Mm -hmm. And as we get all of this input, yeah. MIT did a study. It said every negative no we get. We need 16 positive affirmations to overcome it. Mm -hmm. And so the question lies, how many negative no's have we taken in? But more importantly, how many positive yeses do we need to start controlling that go inside of us? Mm -hmm. And before you know it, you're 25, 35, 45, 55 years old. The only thing you want to do is take a nap, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you, the world's not exciting. We don't go... We begin to go after something, and then what do we do? We tell ourselves we won't understand it. We tell mm -hmm. ourselves we can't do that. Mm -hmm. And it's from the programming that we took in at a young age. So, and, and some people think it, they, they create voids. I got a void in my life. I must fill it with um, money. I need to fill it with women or love. I need to fill it with drugs and alcohol. Drugs and alcohol is a big thing. Mm -hmm. You know, some, some say we got to fill it with God. And I say this, you know, as if you read in religion, there's a God within us. 
we are created within, you know, and so they want to fill it with all of these things. And I say this, the only void is the void that you're five years old, you're whole, complete and perfect. Mm -hmm. And you have a lot of questions that have not been answered, mm -hmm. you know? And so these are some of the things that when we start, when we take from that five-year-old, if we start believing we're five years old and we have questions and we start going after these things, we start controlling our input with a routine. Some of my routines, as soon as I wake up, I have this headset, I sleep with it on. Mm -hmm. As soon as I wake up, the first 20 minutes, the most important part of your day, it sets the tone for where your day. Mm -hmm. And so I put these in and I put something on and it says, Jonathan, you're in control of this day. Jonathan, you are a product of the choices and decisions you make today. Your future relies on the choices and decisions you make today. And I listen to that for probably an hour as I go through my morning routine. Mm -hmm. And then I do it in the middle of the day and at the end of the day. Because as you may know as well as I do, that this world, there's a lot of negative in it. Mm -hmm. So we have to take a conscious effort to find positive, Absolutely. to put positive in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So today, today you're a motivational speaker and you speak very well, but did Thank you me. have these qualities before you met with an accident or the accident was a blessings for you so that you were able to identify the God given gift within you. But before the accident, did you know that you have all the skills with you? Okay. It, it, before the accident, there was a definite gift to gab. I love to speak to people, mm -hmm. the skills, were skills that I built up, that I learned with, with working with Les Brown, with uh, other speakers and doing research and development myself with books, motivational tapes, seminars, going to these, uh, this, going to these, this extent of really pouring in positive image. It's like anybody who has a dream or a goal Mm -hmm. that they want to go after, we look to the people that's already achieved it. We yeah. start researching many people that have achieved, it, have achieved it, and then we start pulling together what are the things they're doing and what can I do. And so the skills have been polished over time. In the very beginning, I'll share this, my very first time speaking. I'm a motivational speaker. I, I, I go to this place. I tell them I'm a speaker. I have a story to tell. I share a little story with them. And I get there, and it's at 7.30 at night. When I get there, they introduce me. This is Jonathan Nolan, the motivational speaker. And I'm so excited, and I'm pumped. They say, you have 55 minutes to speak. You have five minutes for a Q&A. And when I started speaking, I spoke all of 20 minutes. And I was out. I had no more. <laughs> I was out of gas. And luckily, every hand in the room went up with questions, which ate up the rest of the time. And so that's another great point is, you know, jump before you're ready. Mm -hmm. I thought I was ready. I went in and I jumped. I told them I sold myself as a speaker. And when I went to speak there, it gave me, it wasn't a failure. Yeah. Many people would look at that and say, Oh, I failed. I don't no, I looked at that and I said, this is not a failure. This is what needs to be improved. And I exactly. went and I wrote down a list of what mm -hmm. needs to be improved. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, I, I speak at that place usually once a month. Okay. And they, they have a, a door. It's, a, it's actually a drug treatment center that they okay. have me come in. And I speak mm -hmm. at their big luncheon once a year. And so they get new clients. And now... Uh, I speak for all of 55 minutes and there's a great Q&A at the end and it's usually a standing ovation every time. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Jonathan, there are a lot of people who are physically fit, but they find themselves that they are in the dark and the void. What advice would you like to give them? You know, I heard this once and it's... Uh, you're never physically ready if you're not mentally prepared. Absolutely. And so 
being physically fit is great. You know, you're in the gym and majority of people in this world are, they have a physically fit to them that, that, that they could do with, but they're not mentally prepared. Mm -hmm. I share this. I'm physically in a wheelchair. Majority of people are mentally in a wheelchair. Exactly. They're in their mental wheelchair. They're wheeling around this world and they have this dream of creating their own business. And as they go through this world, they come up against the curb. And instead of standing up and going after that, mm -hmm. they turn around. And then it's, it's the same thing. So I share with people, stand up in the mental wheelchair. Notice your fears. Mm -hmm. Notice the things that you turn away from. Notice the hesitations you have in life. Mm -hmm. And a big thing would be hesitations. We're not supposed to hesitate when we want to speak up what's on our heart. We're yeah. not supposed to hesitate when venturing off into a, a dream of ours. You know, you're supposed to hesitate when you get a tattoo. You know, you would hesitate on something like that. You hesitate on serious things, but majority of people hesitate when speaking up. And again, it takes us back to the five, ten year old pattern. We look back at it and we say, say, you know, you're a kid in class and the teacher asks a question and your hand goes up. You're so excited. I have the answer. The teacher calls on you and you blurt it out of your mouth. And it's wrong. The whole class comes up in an uproar and they start laughing at you. At that moment, we tell ourselves something. I'll never put myself in a position to be laughed at again. Mm -hmm. I'm so stupid. I never get it right. I'm always wrong. And that's that foundation we create for the rest of our life. And, and I love to talk about this stuff because you know, there's a breakdown, really. You have an event of what happened, and you have a story that you tell yourself about that event. Mm -hmm. And in, for, for instance, me, I was 12 years old, and there, my school was at the end of the street, and at, right at the opposite end of the street, there was a convenience store that I walked by every day. Mm -hmm. And I went into that convenience store and I told the gentleman, I said, I will stock your coolers and sweep your floors for a job. I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'll take out your garbage. And he gave me a job. I got paid $15 a week for five days a week. I was so excited. I was a grown man. I have a job. I'm in the sixth grade and I have a job. I was, I was the man. I fell and I had this beautiful girlfriend in the sixth grade and she wore this <laughs> gold necklace mm -hmm. and on that gold necklace, it had a whole series of charms, mm -hmm. there was a whole bunch of charms. Mm -hmm. So my first week I got paid $15. There was a pawn shop right next door and I went into that pawn shop and they had a whole bunch of charms and I picked out this one. It said, I love you. And I bought it, it was $15, my whole check gone, but I was in love. And I was excited that Monday morning, I woke up and I had the charm in hand and I get to school and I give it to my girlfriend and she loves it. Well, the very next day, I go into school and they call me into the office and my teacher's there with her parents. And my teacher's telling her parents that Jonathan's a bad influence telling her parents that he probably stole this charm. Mm -hmm. And they gave the charm back to me. And when they gave that charm back to me, I ran home crying and I told myself, because of where I live, because I was poor, people will always judge me. Mm -hmm. Because I, that I'm not lovable, that these women, no matter what, well, at that time, that my girlfriends are always gonna find a reason to leave me. Their parents were, and I told myself all of these stories and I created a foundation that through the rest of my life until I was actually able to start developing myself and, and separate the event from the story, mm -hmm. that I created a foundation that every relationship I ended up in, that I would leave them before they left me, mm -hmm. that something was going to wind up wrong. When in actuality, what really happened? 
What really happened is I went to school and her parents said those things, the teacher said those things, and they gave me the charm back. The story of me not being loved, the story of, of me uh, that no one's going to accept me because I, we don't have much money and we were poor, that story was not real. That's not true. It's mm -hmm. not, it's, it's fiction. But when they're collapsed together, when the event and the story are collapsed together, we believe that these events, that this is what, what we are. Mm -hmm. But when we can separate it, we can see the story's not real. There's possibility there, meaning we can create. There's nothing there, so I can create new possibilities with nothing. That makes sense? Absolutely, absolutely. I know that you're a fantastic storyteller. Uh, Jonathan, tell me, how, how did Les Brown and the whole Brown family influence you? Because uh, do you think it's important to have very positive people around you? In that case, how did Les Brown, and most of your friends are speakers, I know, or most of them, how did they influence you and how important is to have positive people in your life and around you? That, I'll tell you, for Peru, it is extremely important. And you may have heard this saying, you hang with nine broke mm. people, you'll be the 10th broke person. Yeah. It is so important that you surround yourself with people, not only that are positive, mm -hmm. but people that are doing what you're doing, mm -hmm. that are encouraging you to mm -hmm. do what you want to do, mm -hmm. and also challenging you. Mm -hmm. to do what you want to do mm -hmm. it goes for the same if you're the smartest person in your group we yeah. need a new group exactly if you want people mm -hmm. that are and here's the thing with this is mm -hmm. let's say people and and i know this for myself i hung out with negative people mm -hmm. i was in a negative crowd mm -hmm. and not just negative with um the law and things even after that when i stopped that there were negative people in conversation. They were complaining mm -hmm. about the news or they were complaining about going to work on a day-to-day -day basis or they were complaining about their kids or whatever it may be. And that negativity is harmful. Yeah. Negativity is where people just, and, or they give their opinions and their mm -hmm. opinions are negative. Mm -hmm. These are so detrimental they 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 hurt you mm -hmm. when you're around them and you don't realize it because you're you're participating in it when someone speaks about the news or they speak about something that triggers you because you can relate to it mm -hmm. and then you start expressing your complaint upon the top of it Mm -hmm. All that does is create a vicious cycle. Yep. And so as us, a majority of people are in these cycles. They are. Why? Because majority of our family. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can go to your family and you'll find that person in the family or majority of people in the family that complain constantly. Yep. And other people, what do they do? Uh, the other people, all they do is confirm it for them. All they do is they... They justify it for them or, you know, I catch myself when I catch myself justifying something, mm -hmm. I can usually relate that to a complaint. Mm -hmm. I can usually relate that to a complaint. So when you decide, when you make that decision that I'm going to transition into finding people that are positive, there's going to be a certain period where you'll be alone in mm -hmm. your life. Yeah. Where it's going to be just you. And that period is so, so, so important. And when you're in that period, it's so important to write it down. Write what kind of man you like to be mm -hmm. with the attributes, with the, the characteristics, with the goals, and also write what kind of people you want to be around. Mm -hmm. That period where you're alone is a period where you get to find out who you are. Mm -hmm. what you love, what you really want in life. Because when we're hanging around people, it's so easy. I'll share this, you know, majority of my life, 
I wanted to fit into everybody else's circle. Mm-hmm. I wanted a car like him. Mm-hmm. I wanted a woman like he. I wanted money like this. I wanted to wear clothes like that. And, and as I always try to fit in these other circles, what I did was push out what was really important to me. Mm-hmm. So I made a defining decision and there was a defining moment where I said, I'm done. I'm going to create my own circle. My circle involves goals, dreams, integrity, ambition, love. And when I created my own circle, you didn't really have to push others away that were once in your circle. They see a difference in you and they don't want to partake in positive. Mm-hmm. They want to stay and it's sad to say this, but a lot of people want to stay in the comfort zone of complaining. They want to stay in the comfort zone of being mediocre. Mm-hmm. You may have heard this. The majority of people die at the age of 25 and yeah. don't make it official till they're 65. Mm-hmm. So they want to stay in that zone. They're, they're complaining, but they're not looking for a solution. Mm-hmm. They're complaining. They just want you to co-sign that. Yep. Co-sign and say, you know, you're absolutely right. They should not have done you like that. You're absolutely right. Yes, that job is no good. Any job in this world has, has an extraordinary amount of potential. But what do you bring to it each day? Do you bring complaining? Do you bring, you know, aggressiveness? Do you bring, you know, slow worth ethics and, you know, just do you bring that negative cloud or do you wake up and go to work mm-hmm. with a smile on your face glowing mm-hmm. that I'm going to do my very best today mm-hmm. and every other day mm-hmm. that I'm going to give more than I have to. There's a secret of law in this world that the more you give, the more you receive. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So Jonathan, thank you very much for taking your time and joining in our show. Ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan. <laughs>